Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Move this a little bit up. Thanks for coming out here bright and early uh, to this talk. Hopefully, we'll have a, a little bit of fun here today um, and try some interesting things. So this talk is going to be about uh, getting uh, initial access through leaked credentials, uh, and it's going to be kind of done in the mindset of an attacker. So we're going to go through various ways that an attacker uh, exploits credentials, finds credentials, how they use them. We'll look at some real-world examples. Uh, we're going to do it in a number of different, different ways. And then at the end, we'll kind of look at how we can counter off uh, that um, and, and defend against it. So a little bit about me first. Uh, my name is Mackenzie. I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, but now I live in the Netherlands. And I work for a French company called GitGuardian. Uh, and you can find me anywhere on my socials at Advocate Mac. So this presentation is going to focus a lot on, I'm gonna, you're going to hear me say the word secrets a lot. So just to get everyone on the same page, what are secrets? So secrets are digital authentication credentials. And typically, these are things like API keys. They may be security certificates. They may be database, or, uh, database peers or other credential peers. So it's something that gives you access to third-party services, allows you to ingest data, encrypt data, decrypt data all of that uh, kind of stuff. What's important to keep in mind about secrets is these are made to be used programmatically. They're made to be used by your applications. They're not meant to be used by humans, but humans touch them. This is where the problem lies in. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm referring to secrets. How do we use secrets today? Well, if we just take a look at our modern application that we have here that's doing all kinds of fun stuff, we're, we may be focusing on one element. We're trying to do something unique with our application. But our application needs to do lots of things uh, as well. So what do we do? Well, we leverage different services, particularly third-party services, to help us do this quickly. So the easiest one to explain is credit card processing. Do you want to write your own credit card processing and deal with the financial complications in law, or should you use, use Stripe? Right? Or same with uh, authentication, like Okta, Algolia. So quickly, our applications end up being a collection of these different third-party services. All of these services need secrets to be able to communicate with each other. But then we need to host our application somewhere. We need to host our code somewhere. We need to test our code somewhere. And so our infrastructure becomes a collection of these services as well. And these all leverage secrets as well. Then once we've launched our application, we've got to monitor it. Uh, We've got sales integrations, and we're not even talking about all the microservices or independent services that we've created, perhaps using APIs. All of this leverages secrets. Every single one of these logos as an attacker is a potential entry point for me to gain access to something. Uh, so this is how we end up with And this is a simplified version. Your applications can end up very quickly having thousands of these applications, these third-party services, and now you have to manage thousands of secrets. So I work for a company called GitGuardian, and each year we publish a report called the State of Secret Sprawl. Uh, and this is basically looking at different areas that we've monitored to try and find leaked credentials. Uh, so the number one place that we look is GitHub. So this is the largest contribution uh, uh, place of source code. If you see my other talk, the next two slides will be familiar, but then, then we'll, get it, we'll get into new stuff. Uh, but I want to do a, a very quick demo uh, using GitHub, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So if I first, if you just bear with me for a minute. So I have here some credentials. These are AWS access tokens. So these are really sensitive, but these are what we call honey tokens. So this is basically is, uh, is basically a trap for attackers. And so what I want to do is I have here a public repository. Uh, this isn't formatted correctly, but it won't matter too much. So this is here is a public repository I've just created called DevCon, uh, DevConf. And I'm going to commit these secrets in this public repository. So by the way, please never do this. This is a terrible idea. Um, but what's going to happen? In about... 20 minutes, near the end of my talk, I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you how many times those keys have tried to be exploited by an attacker, just in this presentation. So I've pushed them publicly on GitHub, and now a bunch of bots are sc scanning the GitHub API, and I'll show you how that's done, 
to try and find these credentials and abuse them. And so we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So moving on, GitHub, very popular place. Over a billion commits are made to GitHub every single year. 85 million new repositories were made last year, and these are just public. So lots of information, lots of source code in, in here. Every single one of those commits, those billion commits, at GitGuardian, we scanned for secrets. Um, and we published our results of how many secrets we actually found. So if you know the answer, don't put up your hand. But anyone here, um, yeah, I'm seeing some familiar faces. Who, who, who here thinks that we've found less than a million credentials on GitHub? More than a million? Well, OK, let's, uh, more than a million, under five million. More than five million. More than 10 million. So we found 10 million. 10 million secrets that we discovered in GitHub public repositories last year. Um, now you may say, OK, but how do we know that these are actually real credentials? How do we know that these aren't just kind of test keys or high entry strings that look like secrets but aren't? And we get around that by validating them. So if we can, if we find an AWS credential like the one I just leaked, then we will check with AWS to see if that's real. And if it's not real, we'll ignore it. So if we look at the progression, we're leaking a lot more secrets than we used to. So in 2020, we found 3 million. And we compare that now, we've found uh, 10 million. So part of this is explained by an increase in GitHub, more code, more secrets, right? But also, it's because we're using secrets in a different way. Now we've got infrastructure as code. So this is changing how we're programmatically using these. And so we're using them in more ways, which is why we're getting more secrets. We can actually have a look at the types of files that leak these secrets. So Python is number one, not because of anything to do with Python, just because it's the most popular language. But we find them in lots of places. JSON files, .env, .env files are you know, really big ones uh, that we find. I leaked mine in a .env file to make it a little bit easier for attackers. Um, and lots of other areas. So uh, we, we, we really find them in all sorts of places. And we have a very long list of other extensions as well. And then if we look at the types of secrets that we most commonly find, data storage is number one, so these are databases, but then also cloud providers are 20%. So this is 2 million cloud provider keys that we found last year in a public repository. And remember that these are only valid cloud provider keys. So 2 million keys, you can do a lot with that. If we never wanted to pay for cloud hosting ever again, we could easily don't do that, but we're, we're don't, not that malicious. Uh, but there's lots of interesting things. Version control platform keys. This one always amuses me because this is your GitHub credentials to your private repository that you've somehow put in a public repository. Um, so a, a bit weird, but it happens. Messaging systems is also another big one. I love these as an attacker because it means I can launch internal phishing campaigns using your own messaging systems. So like a Slack web hook, I can post in there. Um, and if we want to look at the kind of specific secrets, there's thousands of secrets that we look for. So it's a very long list. But Google API keys are really the number one. Um, Google Cloud keys going down, and we find lots of other interesting things uh, as well. Google, Google OAuth tokens, these are very sensitive. Um, so we're finding lots and lots of these. So lots of different secrets that we're finding out there in GitHub. All right, so how do attackers find these? There's a couple of ways. This is the first way, and it's the least interesting way, in my opinion, but I'll talk about it because it's the easiest. So this is just using the GitHub search feature to try and find uh, credentials. So here, I'm looking for a file name called credentials, and I'm looking for an AWS access ID inside that. Uh, the syntax has changed a little bit since this slide, but it's the same thing. The reason why this isn't that great is because most of the secrets on GitHub are buried in commit history. So when you're doing something in version control in Git, a record of that is maintained for a very long, well, forever in your Git history, unless you rewrite your Git history, which is a whole nightmare. Uh, so this only looks at the top level. So it's missing most of the secrets that you'll find. It's also going to have a lot of false positives. But there's a lot of what we call GitHub dorking, and we can use these. And you will find some things if you have enough time, you'll be able to find it. But there's a much easier way to do malicious things with GitHub, and that's abusing the GitHub uh, API. So GitHub has an API, api.github.com forward slash events. You don't need authentication to look at this. Anyone can. Um, and there's a, a bunch of events on here. There's two that we're interested in. Public event, when a private repository is turned public, and the push event, when we push code. I can show you what this looks like. This is it here. 
And you, you get information like we have the email address of users. This is all public. You don't need authentication. So if I wanted to target a specific organization, let's say I wanted to just scan commits made by at Twilio domains, because I'm on a target Twilio, then you can filter that out um, using this. The credential I leaked is in this ledger. It's been published on here, and this is how the attackers are finding it, because they're monitoring this, they're scanning it. It's very easy to do, and uh, that's how they're going to find the credentials. So when we say public repositories, it's easy to think that, OK, it's public. Therefore, if someone knows it exists, they can view it. But we also have to understand that it's broadcast. It's not just public as in someone needs to know you exist so that they can find it. It's on a ledger, and they don't need to have any information about you. If you leak it, someone is going to find it. Um, here's a, just a quick example uh, of a, a real-life attack that happened with Toyota. Uh, a Toyota contractor, so not Toyota themselves, leaked database credentials belonging to a mobile application called T-Connect. Uh, adversaries were able to find these, and this was in a public repository. So what's interesting about this and why I like this example is because it wasn't even Toyota that did it. It was someone that was working with Toyota. Uh, and we have lots of examples of when source code is leaked, or what I call involuntarily open sourced. Uh, so there's lots of these examples here. Uh, of, of source code being publicly leaked. Uh, if we take one example, we could use Twitch. Samsung is another one. There was 6,000 repositories that were leaked from Twitch due to a misconfiguration, and we found over 6,000 secrets when we scanned it. We found 194 AWS credentials. This is pretty typical. This, this isn't because Twitch was terrible. It's just there's a lot of data, and secrets are in source code. There's another way that we can find uh, private uh, information, and that's doing wide sale scanning for .git directory. So when you go git init, it creates a folder called .git. Inside that is all your metadata. Inside that is your history of your project. It regularly happens that these .git folders end up on your, uh, end up on your servers. And if you have a public, if that's publicly available, your website's public, your .git directory is public too, which means I can not only find your source code, I can find all your source code history from there. So there was some, Cyber News did some large scale scanning and found two million accidentally exposed .git directories, um, which is, is problem because if you're thinking that your source code is private, it's much less private than you think. Because even without all of this, it's cloned onto your developer's machines, it's backed up into wikis. So as an attacker, I know that I'm going to find secrets in your source code. So it's there, there's lots of opportunity for me to really do that. Why does secrets end up inside source code? Why is this such a problem? So I'm sure no one here would hard code credentials into their, their source. I'm sure no one would do that. But why does it happen? I'll give you the most common example that we have. Here we have a very simple Git branch that you see. You have your main branch, but you, then you also have some development features on there. So let's say that I say to you, hey, I want you to create an integration with Algolia. Here's a key. Please create this new feature. So you go off on a feature branch, and the first thing that you do, just because you want to test this, right, is you add in your secret, that green dot there. You've added in your secret uh, into that, just to quickly test it. You're on your own branch, no one's going to see it, it's fine, you're testing it. Right, it works, now you're going to remove it. You remove those secrets and you put them as an environment variable or however you handle them, um, and then it, later on it comes to code review. Your reviewer is not going to look at all your history, at least I haven't met a reviewer that does. Maybe you do, that's, that's fine, but that's a lot of work. But they're going to compare the latest version, which has no secrets in it, with what's happening in the main branch and make sure that that's going to work well. They're not going to go through the history, but that's where you have a secret. So this is why we have so much secrets in our Git repositories and in our source code that we don't know exist. And this is why attackers are after them so much. Uh, we also find secrets in logs or auto-generated files. Let's say that you're doing a debug. You've got a problem, so you dump out your environment in that debug log, and your environment has environment variables, which are secrets. Uh, we find them uh, if we don't have a, a .git ignore is a very simple way of preventing certain files entering into your git stash and your git repositories. If there's no .git file, then obviously those are going to enter in there. 
Uh, we find lots of weird things when you do wildcard commands, like git add all, if you've got like secrets.txt or whatever file in there, you go git add all, that gets captured, uh, put in there. In templates, so if you create, I don't know there's any Django developers here, but when you create a, a Django, it automatically creates keys and pushes it in there. Unless you know that they're there, then they can end up in your uh, directory, and even if you remove them later, that's, they're still there. Um, and then the other one, the main one, is that we find people just find it convenient to share secrets on Git. So they just put them in there uh, in an env file because they think that they're protected by authentication. But hopefully, as I've just kind of proven, source code is not as private or as secure as you expect. All right, so I want to move away from uh, just source code, and I want to start looking at some uh, other, other technologies that we can find secrets in. So hopefully everyone here is familiar with Docker. If not, it's like a mini virtual machine that you can package your application and its dependencies in. Uh, and there's a place called Docker Hub, which contains most of the, the Docker images. There's more than 10 million publicly available Docker images on Docker Hub. Um, and so we wanted to have a look at how many secrets were in there. Now, Docker, like some, some other ones, we find huge amounts of secrets. So almost 5% of the images on Docker Hub contain at least one plain text secret that can use it. This may be for a package manager. It may be for your application. It's typically different types of secrets than we'll see in source code because it's usually more related to the infrastructure than it is to your services because hopefully you've removed all your API keys uh, from here. But there's still a huge amount of, of Docker images. And I don't have time, but sometimes I like to do a demo of actually breaking apart a Docker image and looking into it. Because a lot of people think that because something's not human readable, that it's, not, that it's secure. But this isn't the case. Docker, you can break it apart, you can decompile them, and you can look at all the layers that are made to build up for it. Uh, and if you're interested, a cool tool to do that is called Dive. Uh, so let's have a look at an attack that's happened because of leaked uh, credentials on Docker that also involve uh, code repositories. So CodeCov is a code coverage tool. It tests how much of your credentials are being, it tests how much of your application is being tested. Uh, so it sits in your CI CD pipeline. It does a small job. Uh, it, it's not that critical, but it's important. Uh, so what happened? When you use CodeCov, you, use, you run their application in your CI CD pipeline using their Docker image. On their official Docker image that was publicly available that people were using, they had a hard-coded credential. That credential gave access, I think it was to a Google storage bucket, which contained a bash uploader file. Attackers were then able to edit that bash uploader file to turn CodeCov malicious. They did something uh, very clever. They added one line of code that said, every time CodeCov is run, I want you to dump all the environment variables, and I want you to send them to me, the attacker. So when we're testing our application, we need to build it. We need, we need these secrets in our environment to be able to connect to everything and make sure it's working. So all those secrets are in our environment. So when we dump our environment, we get all those secrets. Now, if you're smart, you're using different credentials for testing than production, but there's some credentials you can't avoid using, namely the, the credentials that the attackers were after were your GitHub uh, or version control system authentication credentials. So this gave the attackers access into 20,000 of their customers' private code repositories. Now, some of these, Twilio, Monday.com, Rapid7, HashiCorp, all had their private source code exposed because of this. So again, you think your source code is private, here's a supply chain attack that gained access to their source code uh, as well. Uh, I don't pick on companies too much, but this is one that I will because I think it illustrates a good point. Uh, is that HashiCorp creates a secrets manager. Probably the best secrets manager available on the market is called Vault. HashiCorp is a great company with amazing security posture. The whole reason and their whole pitch behind Vault is that Vault reduces the need to ever touch credentials and therefore you won't have secrets inside your source code. If you use Vault, you won't have secrets inside your source code. Because of the CodeCov incident, HashiCorp had their private source code accessed. And guess what they found? they had to report that they had secrets inside their source code uh, because of it. So if HashiCorp has secrets in their source code, no one else has any chance of being able to solve this problem. All right, so moving away from Docker images, I want to now talk about another thing, and that's mobile applications. Uh, so again, what is a mobile application? So you go onto the Play Store, 
Uh, you, look at, uh, you look at your applications and, and, and what are they? So similar to a Docker image, you assume that these are non-human readable, they're packaged up in some black box, therefore they're secure, right? Uh, definitely not the case. Um, what are mobile applications? They're glorified zip folders. Uh, in the case of Apple, it's literally just a zip folder. Uh, so it, the, the extension that they compiled to is .apa for Apple, .apk uh, for Android. Um, and these are easily reversible. Uh, so, how, how can we reverse uh, an Android application? Very simple, we can download it uh, on our computer using a simple tool called uh, Gplay Downloader. We can decompile it with a tool called RedX, and then we can scan it with a secret scanner. I'm, in this case, I'm using ggshield uh, to do it. So this is the workflow to be able to find secrets inside uh, an Android application. Literally anyone can do this. It's very, very simple. Uh, you, don't, you don't need any special skills. All the tools are available. Super simple. Uh, I have a quick demo. I probably don't have time of actually just how simple it is. Uh, I took a random mobile application and from the Play Store, and I, I, I broke it apart. We'll just skip forward. And then I scanned it. Once I had uh, decompiled it, I scanned it for secrets. And if we skip forward, you'll see that we find a lot of secrets in here, including Google API keys. Uh, and if we go to the top, we'll get to a lot. Um, so these are all secrets that we've found in this mobile application. This was a real application. It's not particularly bad. This, this is just uh, what it is. You'll see that we have valid uh, Slack web hooks. So potentially, I could post some internal messages, try and trick your users. We have valid Google API keys in here as well. Um, so we don't need to go on to too much, but that's just to illustrate how simple it is to, uh, to be sort of decompile and scan for secrets in mobile applications. Apple's even easier. So again, a tool to download Apple. When I say they're glorified zip folders, how you extract an, an APA is you just change the extension to .zip, and then you just extract it. Um, and then you can scan that for secrets. Uh, so. How many, how, how many of these secrets do we typically find? Well, first let me talk about a, a real life example. This is from my friend Jason Haddix, who's a, uh, an ethical hacker. And, uh, and this was an exploit where he found for a bug bounty. So there was a, a bank application. We're not allowed to say what it is. But this bank had a mobile application with it. One of the features of this bank, an American bank, one of the top five, was that you could take a picture of a check and then with the app and then cache that check. What, by looking at the code and decompiling it, what he found is that these images weren't being encrypted, they were being stored on the phone's memory. He then found that these were being sent to an Amazon S3 bucket. He found the keys to that Amazon S3 bucket hard-coded in the mobile application, and then whammo, he found 10,000 images of checks in plain, in, in plain form on an Amazon S3 bucket that he had access to. So this is an example of kind of showing, this is a bank, right? You wouldn't expect a bank to have hard-coded credentials for something as sensitive as this, but this is the state of, world, of the world that we are. And in fact, huge amounts of mobile applications have secrets. How many? So my friends at Cyber News uh, did uh, a full study on this. Uh, oh, did I remove them? Okay, I did. So about half, they found out about half of mobile applications on, uh, on the Play Store contain secrets. So huge problem, huge problem that we have here that everyone is facing. So as an attacker, I have lots of opportunity to try and gain access to these credentials using different ways. I wanna go quickly back to the demo that I did and let's hope that we have lots of things. So I have a Slack channel here. Every time someone has tried to abuse my credentials since I've been talking, it's posted here an alert that someone's tried to use those credentials uh, and given me their IP address. So if we look, uh, we have, this first one was me testing it, but here we have uh, already, uh, this, is their, this is the IP addresses that we have. So there's a few different ones in here. So in this period, because it does it in five minute periods, so in this period, we've already had about seven attacks from it. And then since then, we've had another two and another two. So about 10. About 10 
bots have tried to exploit the AWS credentials that I leaked in public GitHub in the last 20 minutes. So this is the, how big of a problem it is, that if credentials get leaked on GitHub, they're going to be found. So what's actually going to happen with my credentials? Throughout the rest of the day, I'm going to get a lot of activity on this. So you'll see here that every time someone does it, it gives me their IP address, and it also lets me know what they've used to do it. So here it's doing a call to get, get my identity. It's basically checking that these are valid. It's going to come back that these credentials are valid, because the Honey tokens are marked as valid, and then what's going to happen? Usually what I'll see is that I'll stop getting activity after a couple of days, and then a month, two weeks, Two months later, I'll get another spike in activity. What's happened in between that, because we can track it, is that these credentials get bundled up and sold on dark web forums. So uh, what's actually happening is the first group of attackers is really good at discovering credentials, right? But they're not very good at doing stuff with them. So then they sell them to a group of attackers that know what to do. Perhaps they want to create a crypto mine. For cloud keys like this, this is often what they'll use for DDoS attacks, is that they'll gather lots of credentials that are valid and then use them to do malicious things. Or they might be looking for specific companies. So my email address uh, in my GitHub is at GitGuardian. So if they wanted to attack at GitGuardian, perhaps they could bundle them as, here are all the credentials from Slack, from GitGuardian, from Twilio, uh, from these people that work at these companies. So that's what an attacker I is going to do. Uh, so how do we prevent this? So first of all, we've got to stop hard coding credentials. This is really the easiest one that we can do. Up here, we have, we have an example. You have your API key is in there. Uh, even if this is just a test, even if we're just wanting to see if just to test that these work, we should never do this because it's going to be in our history and if you've ever had the experience of trying to rewrite history in a group project, you'll know the unbelievable pain that comes with that. Uh, so once they're in there, they're pretty much in there. Uh, we need to use the correct secrets managers, and this is not always the best. So the best secrets manager, as I've talked about, is probably HashiCorp Vault. Maybe there's some other ones that you could argue are just as good or better, uh, but that's really at the top. The problem is that this is very heavy. If you have got a group of five people working on a project and you want to use Vault, you basically need one of those five people just to manage Vault and just to manage a secret server. It's very heavy, it's very complicated, and then what's going to happen is that you're going to get sick of using it, so then you're going to store secrets.txt on your homepage so you don't have to deal with it. Um, so maybe Vault's not the best solution. Then you can kind of go to SAS versions of Vault, one called Doppler that's not up here, you've got a key list. One password has a great secrets manager for developers as well with cool stuff like VS Code integrations. Um, then you can use, if that's too heavy, you don't want to have a dedicated area for Secrets Manager. If you're hosting it on the cloud, there's Secrets Managers in here. These lack a lot of the features, but at least if you start using these, you'll get an idea. It makes it difficult to share secrets. Um, and then the last one, and every security person will tell you that this is a bad idea, that this is terrible. I'm one of the few that will say it's okay. So this is encrypting your secrets and then storing them in an encrypted file on Git. This is a terrible idea for a few reasons. It gives you a single point of failure. That encrypted file is going to sprawl with your source code. So if it, if it does get cracked, you have a problem. However, why I say it's OK is that if this is what it takes to get you from hard coding your credentials, if this is the lowest point of area that I can get you to actually do it, then do it. Just do that. I'll work on the rest of the stuff later. But if you can just encrypt them to start with, um, then that's really where we need to start. Using uh, automated secrets detection. Secrets. Uh, at this point, there's a lot of secrets detection tools that are really good. Uh, a lot of them are open source. I work for a company called GitGuardian, uh, so I'm totally biased in anything I say about them, but we have commercial tools available with dashboards and stuff. We also have some open source tools, but there's lots of other open source tools. And so it really depends on what you want to do. But, you know, traffic hog, git leaks, these can all detect secrets, and if, and if, uh, and as I get, if that's the start, just to use some tools, all of these can be used to create things like Git hooks to prevent you from committing secrets. Um, and, and they can also be used to scan your directories. And I've used ggshield to be able to do, you know, scan the mobile applications and, and other things like that. Um, and just some final thoughts, you know, rotate your secrets regularly. Don't use long-lived secrets. The added benefit of rotating regularly means that you know how to do it. Because when a secret gets leaked, you might be alerted. There might be uh, traffic 
that you're unfamiliar with, but no one knows what that secret does and who's in control of it and what happens if I rotate it. If you have a rotation policy, then you're gonna be good at it. So if you do have a breach, it's gonna be better. Limit your privileges. Stop creating admin tokens. If all you need to do is read information, make sure that's all that you can do with that key. Uh, whitelist your services. So if you know that this service is meant to be talking to this service, if you can make it so that only that can happen. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So here are some QR codes. The state of secrets for all is the report that all this information is in. So you can download that if you want. And here we have a white paper on how to manage your secrets. I'd like give you a benchmark against other people. Uh, but thank you all for coming out early and watching me. And if you have any questions, I'll be gladly to take them now. So thanks, guys. <laughs> any questions? Yes. I'm wondering, uh, so uh, many of the requests that you did you go to your APIs to create a uh, single come from more of the same zone. Is, is, it, is it possible that some of them are actually just bots trying to uh, try to see, like good bots trying to see if it goes to your system and how it and Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one of them definitely is. So one of them, because I leaked AWS credential. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. So the question was uh, in the information that we have on the Slack channel. Um, could some of them be good uh, and, and are all of them malicious? So I don't know about all of them. I know that some of them are malicious because we can monitor it, but some of them are good too. One of these IP addresses is going to be from Amazon uh, themselves. Uh, Amazon is actually one of the companies doing the most to prevent secrets leaks, and they are looking on GitHub themselves, and if they find a key, they will actually try and alert you to the fact that your key's leaked as well. So there's definitely going to be some of them, but there's thousands of credentials. This is one case that Amazon is doing particularly good at. Um, uh, and yeah, there used to be some other, other services, so SHH, uh, SHH leaks or something like that would, would be doing it. And this was kind of like a gray service where it, would, it wouldn't alert you, but you could see all the secrets. Uh, so yeah, some of them are, and you'll probably notice that like some of the IP addresses are the same, like these ones. Uh, so it's, it's hard to know, but definitely some malicious activity and, uh, and definitely some, some good activity as well. Uh, any other questions? No, no problems. Uh, if you want to learn how to make honey tokens like this, it's incredibly easy. In 10 minutes, I'm doing a workshop on how to do it, uh, where I run through where it's just an open source tooling. Um, and it's a lot of fun. So if you want to know how to make these, um, yeah, I'm running a workshop in about 10 minutes in A218, I think. Uh, but yeah, thanks everyone for paying attention and I uh, hope to see you again soon.